All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. And uh, thank you, Dr. Palmer, for being here with us. Uh, Tom Palmer is a senior fellow, fellow at the Cato Institute. He's a director of the Institute's Educational Division at Cato University. He's vice president for international programs at the Atlas Economic Research Foundation and general director of the Atlas Global Initiative for Free Trade, Peace, and Prosperity. And uh, we're here today talking about Students for Liberty's new book edited by Dr. Palmer, Peace, Love, and Liberty. Uh, it's available, uh, I'll put the link in chat in just a moment, uh, from, from SFL for free for student groups. And it's it got essays by uh, contributors such as uh, Radley Balco, Professor Steven Pinker, uh, Sarah Squire, Kathy Reisenwitz, and, and more. So uh, definitely check out the book. And without further ado, I present, uh, well, first, Dr. Palmer's uh, research in assistants. Uh, I believe their names are Tiggy and Rosie. And they, he, if you're friends with him on Facebook, he loves his research assistants very much. And I'm sure they're very helpful. Um, without further ado, Tom Palmer. Well, thank you very much, Matt. And it's a pleasure to be uh, here with you and on this uh, liberty.me project or pr program. Uh, this book is going to be distributed to university students and high school students all around the world. The first press run will be uh, in English, 350,000 copies, and then we expect other languages to follow after that. The previous books in the series on uh, the economics of freedom, on the morality of capitalism, after the welfare state, and the most recent one, Why Liberty, have also been distributed in a very substantial number of copies, somewhere in the neighborhood of a million and a half or so. Uh, and in as many as 30 languages. So this is part of a, of a major project. It's a joint project of the Atlas Network and of Students for Liberty. We distribute these jointly uh, through student groups and through the think tanks in the Atlas uh, Network. So just to look at this issue, uh, obviously there's no issue more important in the world than uh, peace or war. If you consider it, the effects of war may sometimes be hard to distinguish from uh, natural events, but there's a big difference. Wars don't just happen, They're not like tornadoes or lightning or other natural occurrences. They have a fundamentally different characteristic, despite the common characteristic of being destructive of human life and capital and assets. The distinguishing feature of war is that it is organized human violence. This is something that many people don't like to face up to when they talk about war or force projection or various euphemisms uh, for war. They like to evade the fact that fundamentally it's organized human violence. I recount in the book a number of occasions when I've interacted with uh, figures who, who systematically want to evade that. The most interesting one in recent American history was the former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, who famously queried General Colin Powell, why aren't we using our soldiers more? Why aren't we sending them here and there to do all these important things? What's the point of this big military force if you don't use it? And as General Powell recounted, he nearly had an aneurysm when he was asked that question. It showed a fundamental misunderstanding of what the military is about and what war or force projection are about. Admiral Jean Larocque, a former uh, uh, Admiral of the United States Navy, explained this to me very clearly many years ago. He was a founder of the Center for Defense Information, which provided uh, uh, alternative sources of information uh, to those from the Pentagon about military spending and the use of military force. He put it very directly. He said, you know, uh, what the military does is we kill the enemy, we destroy their stuff and their ability to harm us. That's our function. Kill people, 
and to destroy things. We're not very good at building bridges unless you want to drive a tank across it. We don't teach eight-year-olds uh, literacy. We're not good at teaching democracy or constitutionalism or law. We kill the enemy and we destroy their stuff. And if you really have to have that done, call on us. Otherwise, don't. It is not like uh, just a social service. It is the organization of human violence. It is more than destroy just human life, assets, wealth, buildings, and other things. It also takes on another very important victim, which is usually overlooked. And the overlooked victim, the one that you can't really photograph, is liberty itself. Liberty is one of the casualties of war. There's never been a war. Uh, in which at the end of it, the victorious party was more free than before, setting aside wars of independence but in terms of interstate war. As Randolph Bourne, the American intellectual, put it in the midst of the First World War, war is the health of the state. If you really want to grow the state, the most effective means to do that is through war. Robert Higgs, the economic historian, has documented this in his very important research, which is footnoted uh, and cited in A Peace, Love, and Liberty, that crises of one sort or another are what grow the state. He talks about, of course, the um, economic crisis of the Great Depression, but also World Wars I, II, Korean War, Vietnam War, and so on, all of which provide powerful engines for the growth of state power. It's also a tremendous opportunity to exact resources from the population, to plunder people. Thomas Paine put it uh, quite elegantly. He said, in reviewing the history of the English government, its wars and taxes, an observer not blinded by prejudice, nor warped by interest, would declare that taxes were not raised to carry on wars, but that wars were raised to carry on taxes. This is also documented in the research of Robert Higgs on the ratchet effect. That spending and taxing uh, skyrocket during wars, and at the conclusion of the war, they may fall back, but never to the level of before the war. There is a ratchet that tends to drive these things upward. It's also an opportunity to steal the liberties of the people. And of course, people are more likely to be submissive to the state when they are told that this is necessary for the defense of their, of, of their lives and liberties from other states. And the consequence is the growth of all sorts of state behavior that directly violates individual liberty. The most obvious example, of course, is conscription. Uh, but let's talk about some of the others beforehand. Number one, National Security Agency has been spying on us illegally, and of course the justification has been that this is necessary to defend us from terrorists. Terrorists are everywhere, we're told. We must be ever vigilant against them, and as a consequence, all of your communications must be trolled through uh, and uh, uh, subjected to scrutiny. The USA Patriot Act, the uniting and strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorists act. Some high-level government bureaucrat was up all night working out that acronym, has brought about an enormous increase in our subjugation to state power. An interesting example uh, that's come into the news recently was the way in which the Department of Agriculture now is authorized to obtain machine guns and a wide variety of uh, weapons for use against American civilians. Why? Because in the Patriot Act, the uh, uh, offices of these agencies were authorized to engage in police powers, and naturally they want to be equipped with all of the latest um, military equipment. One of the authors in the book, Radley Balco, submitted a very nice essay, very helpful and useful, on the militarization of American policing. And it really is quite horrifying. Much of this was authorized uh, under the USA Patriot Act, which was pushed through during a period of panic and a kind of hysteria, such that the most 
the great majority of Congress didn't read the bill at all before casting their vote on it. But then, of course, the greatest assault on individual liberty, which is conscription. This is an issue on which I've been involved for many, many years. I was very active in the anti-conscription movement going back to the 1970s and was a founder and the National Secretary of the Committee Against Registration in the Draft, which was a coalition of a wide variety of organizations who were opposed to military conscription. The Carter administration uh, was seeking to bring that back. We did get, unfortunately, um, uh, compulsory registration. And there was a big, big move to bring back military conscription with a stop to the uh, left of the political spectrum by saying, oh, of course, you'd have the option of being enslaved to the state in the social services bureaucracy. We almost got selective service uh, eliminated. Unfortunately, we failed and it persists. And all young men of 19 years of age are required under penalty of law, which is to say central jail sentence, uh, to register as the chattel of the American government. I hope someday we can eliminate this as well. Now, the fear of standing wars, of standing armies, and of war was a major part of the Enlightenment, and in particular of the American Enlightenment. Professor Robert MacDonald has an essay in the book on the American Enlightenment and its attitude towards war, Jefferson and Washington and Madison and others, and the general intellectual background and the fear that they had of the war-making powers of the state. James Madison, the primary author of the American Constitution, put the issue very neatly. Of all the enemies to public liberty, war is perhaps the most to be dreaded because it comprises and develops the germ of every other. MacDonald uh, uh, goes through this very clearly, all of the concerns about concentration of powers in the hands of the chief uh, executive, the executive branch of government, insofar as the president is also commander in chief of the armed forces. And indeed, many of the things that the American founders warned against and attempted to hedge against has since come to pass, uh, substantially driven by the wars of the American government of the past centuries. Now, if we think about that today, we might take Madison's attitude uh, for granted. Of course, everyone's against war. Uh, I run into that frequently. How could anyone be in favor of war? Well, in fact, the tradition for much of human history was that war was taken just as a, as a, a constant. It was the background uh, of all of human life, and it was even celebrated. Heraclitus of Ephesus, in one of his uh, famous comments, said, War is the father of all and the king of all. And some he shows as gods, others as men. Some he makes slaves and others free. That was, at his t time, the primary social distinction between uh, slavery and freedom. And he argued that that was indeed a feature of war, which undeniably it was. The war permeated all of human life, and for much of human history, it was just assumed to be the background condition. Indeed, many people, even into the modern era, celebrated it. Joseph de Maistre, a particularly significant and loathsome European reactionary, uh, remarked that war was the habitual state of mankind, which is to say that human blood must flow without interruption somewhere or other on the globe and that for every nation, peace is only a respite. War was celebrated as the source of every social advance. Uh, John Ruskin, the famous Victorian a Tory socialist and art critic, uh, in his lecture on war, praised war. He said that there is no uh, pacific or non-warlike nation that has ever produced any great art. The war was the source of all social advance and all of the good things in life. This may seem ludicrous to us today, but it was in fact a very, very common view and even the dominant view among intellectuals, if not among those who had to suffer and pay with their blood. Now, the modern age is the only time when we see a truly anti-war philosophy gain traction. Of course, uh, looking at history, you can see undoubtedly people who opposed war, uh, and of course intellectuals and religious leaders who also opposed it. 
but not many. It would be very difficult to find anything resulting in anti-war movement until the modern era. And that anti-war movement in its first uh, uh, incarnation in the world is known as liberalism. To avoid confusion in the American context where the word liberalism has acquired a rather different meaning, it's known in the U.S. as classical liberalism or libertarianism. And the key element was, first, that peace is morally superior, and second, that it is practical, that institutions and norms can be, can be promulgated that will make war less likely, and that that is a good thing. And it is possible for different nations, cultures, religions, ethnicities, languages, and so on, to coexist peacefully without coming into conflict. Now, this has become a much more significant feature of modern life, although there are still many, and I'll speak about them in a moment, who revel in war and who promote it as a source of virtue and uh, other social advances, not to mention so-called economic stimulus. The difference between this new philosophy of liberalism or libertarianism and other ideologies is very important. Uh, Frederick Bastiat put it so well in his address to the youth of France, and that is to say that the socialists, but also all other anti-liberal philosophies, have conflict at their heart. As he said, although they have a kind of sentimental love of humanity in their hearts, hate flows from their lips. Each of them reserves all his love for the society that he has dreamed up, but the natural society in which it is our lot to live cannot be destroyed soon enough to suit them, so that from its ruins may rise the new Jerusalem. As he explained further, uh, other non-liberal philosophies saw the world as characterized by fundamental antagonisms, and they were everywhere. It's in property owner and worker, labor and capital, common people and bourgeoisie, agriculture, industry, farmer and city dweller, native-born and the foreigner, producer and consumer, and so on. That, that was what characterized the modern world, was fundamental antagonisms everywhere, uh, not merely uh, between warring parties, but that life was characterized by antagonism. Now, you might think that there's no one really in favor of, of war, actual warfare anymore, but you would be wrong about that. In fact, I'd like to introduce you to one of the most influential political thinkers of the last hundred years. His work has had an enormous impact, although he's not so frequently cited and is not known by very many people. You find him influencing those intellectuals who speak publicly. His name was Carl Schmitt. He was a very significant thinker in Germany in uh, uh, theoretical um, jurisprudence. He became a state counselor, and he was uh, also a member of the National Socialist Party. There's an image here with his friend, the novelist Ernst Junger, the author of a tremendously important novel of the First World War called The Storm of Steel, which is a glorification of war and had an enormous impact in Germany and beyond about the, that led to militarization and certainly contributed dramatically to the rise of fascism, collectivism generally, and the Second World War and the horrors that emerged from that. It's worth thinking for a moment, and I discuss this in the book, the difference between two very important figures, Erich Rem Maria Remarque, who was the author of All Quiet on the Western Front, a, a very important and profound novel showing the horror, the futility and the degradation of war. Uh, he was uh, forced into exile. He had to escape from Germany. His books were publicly burned, and he ended up in Switzerland and then came to the United States of America. Jens Junger, in contrast, was celebrated. His books were published and republished, and he had a massive influence on the uh, uh, growth of collectivism in Europe and to this day is still celebrated by collectivist uh, intellectuals of both the left and the right. The 
characteristic uh, of this was not merely a kind of philosophy, but also the fact that aesthetic consciousness was enlisted in the cause of war. Uh, Jens Junger, here pictured as an old man, he was over 100 years old when he died, uh, described the experience, his experience in the First World War as a stormtrooper, that is to say, the one who jumped into the um, trenches and fought hand to hand as a truly glorious experience. I learned from this very four year schooling in war and all the fantastic extravagance of material warfare, there are ideals in comparison with which the life of an individual and even of a people has no weight. These are referred to, by the way, as the ideas of 1914. Uh, nationalism, socialism, collectivism, militarism. And though the aim for which I fought as an individual, as an atom in the whole body of the army, was not to be achieved, the material force cast us apparently to the earth, yet we learn once and for all to stand for a cause and, if necessary, to fall as befitted men. It is not every generation that is so favored. So just think about that for a moment. He was a participant in the horrors of the First World War. He saw his friends massacred and mowed down. He stood in blood and mud up to his hips, and he wrote, it is not every generation that is so favored. Uh, really a truly loathsome human being, but unfortunately a very important voice in aesthetics. In my opinion, the aesthetic element is also significant, not merely economic, philosophical, and political. And in this book, there is extensive discussion of art and war. It includes poetry by Wilfred Owen, by Mark Twain, and a wonderful essay by Sarah Squire, who is a, a figure in American literature and a poet in her own right. Schmidt, who was a good friend uh, with Ernst Junger and had a lifelong correspondence with him, wrote a very influential book, The Concept of the Political, that came out in three editions. The only one available is the 1932 edition. The 1933 edition was openly Nazi and included a vile anti-Semitic rhetoric. Unsurprisingly, after the war, he only allowed republication of the earlier 1932 edition, which was a bit less open about his uh, sympathies. But even in that 1932 edition, he's very clear what characterizes the political relations of human beings is the distinction between friend and enemy. And as he noted, an enemy exists only when, at least potentially, one fighting collectivity of people confronts a similar collectivity. So political life is characterized at its core by the distinction between the friend and the enemy. This is in distinction to uh, liberal perspectives, which does not see enemy relationships as inherent in human life. But for Schmidt, it was unavoidable. It was always there. Nations would always stand in the relationship of enemy to one another. Now, this theory is not only significant in uh, obscure realms of political thought, but one sees it playing out again very openly and clearly in Europe, in which the concepts of Carl Schmitt are being re-invoked uh, in the conflicts over Ukraine and elsewhere, especially the language of his essay on great space ordering, or Großraumordnung in German, uh, which has been effectively cited almost word for word uh, by advocates of the expansion of one of the European states, namely Russia, at the expense of its neighbors. So this philosophy is very much alive, and not only on the right or on fascist regimes, but it permeates the collectivism, all sorts of collectivism. Slavo Zizek, who's an influential European Marxist theorist, gets lots and lots of attention. In his writing on Schmidt, he also identified Schmidt as a fundamental thinker of the anti-liberal intellectual consensus. And he asked, in typical uh, academic leftist language, is not the relationship, relationship to an external other as the enemy a way of disavowing the internal struggle which traverses the social body? In contrast to Schmidt, a leftist position should insist on the unconditional primacy of the inherent antagonism as constitutive of the political. 
In other words, rather than seeing enemies in other countries or abroad, the enemy friend relationship permeates all polities and all political structures between, again, capital and labor, bourgeoisie and proletariat, and so on and so forth. Interestingly enough, he misstates Schmidt. Schmidt did not see the enemy as inherently external, but also, especially in the 1933 edition and in his other writings during the Nazi period, made it clear that the enemy could be internal as well. And it's obvious what he had in mind by that, which was the Jews, which he conceived as the enemy, the inherent enemy of the German people, and therefore had to be exterminated. That thinking that there are inherent enemies is essential to collectivism. Now, the need for struggle and for enemies promotes war and more war. In the American context, we see the neoconservatives, who also, by the way, are influenced by Schmidt through their teacher, Leo Strauss, who was a, a close correspondent with Schmidt. Uh, William Crystal and Robert Kagan uh, made it very, very clear. As they said, a true conservatism of the heart ought to emphasize both personal and national responsibility. Relish the opportunity for national engagement, embrace the possibility of national greatness, and restore a sense of the heroic. That somehow, uh, in order to be a heroic nation, you had to engage in war. We should relish the opportunity for national engagement. Notice the euphemism there for war, national engagement. And then we would embrace the possibility of national greatness. National greatness normally coming at the expense of other nations, naturally, and restore a sense of the heroic. This is Carl Schmitt speaking to us uh, through the voice of modern American neoconservatism. Now, that philosophy of inherent antagonism is very much alive today, certainly among intellectuals. Stephen Pinker, in his wonderful book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, uh, documents the decline of war and asks what accounted for that. And liberalism is one of the more important elements, the growth of the philosophy of liberalism and the institutions that it brought about, notably commerce and trade and limited government. In speaking of the counter-enlightenment, uh, those who embrace and endorse violence and warfare, he says, the counter-enlightenment rejected the assumption that violence was a problem to be solved. Struggle and bloodshed are inherent in the natural order and cannot be eliminated without draining life of its vitality and subverting the destiny of mankind. There he's not quoting his own view or the view of liberalism, but rather the views of the counter-enlightenment. Struggle and bloodshed are inherent in the natural order. In contrast, liberalism established a very, very different principle. That conflict is present in human life, but it is a problem to be solved. It can be reduced through good institutions and through the promulgation of moral norms, of toleration and respect for the rights of other people. When it boils down to it, war is the result of a human choice. And I think it's pretty clear if we can make the choice for war, we can also make the choice for peace. The choice of war or peace is the most important choice that lovers of liberty face. There really is nothing else quite as significant. Now, I should point out we have other cases of war, such as the war on drugs and so on, uh, that uh, carry over characteristics of war because it is violent and extremely destructive. Uh, but in comparison to some regulatory policy, uh, on prices of milk and so on, or whether you can have raw milk. Those are all important questions, but all of them are dwarfed by the question of war and peace. Now, the key conditions of peace uh, that uh, economic historians and Pinker and others have identified are not that difficult to find out. Limited and accountable government. That is to say, the opportunity for people to criticize their government, the opportunity to uh, examine the books to ask what is this money being spent for? What is happening here? Active public discussion of these issues rather than mere acquiescence to the decisions of our leaders and citizens who actively challenge their government, voice, vote, and civil disobedience to take on governments that are leading their people into war. And then, very important also, trade and cross border investment and travel. There's an old saying, when goods cannot cross borders, armies will. 
and the empirical data strongly supports the case for what is known as the free trade peace. Professor Eric, Professor Eric Gartsky has an original essay in the book. He's professor of political science at University of California, San Diego, and at University of Ex Essex in the United Kingdom, making the case very strongly that trade diminishes the likelihood of war. And this is often misstated by critics who say, oh, you think trade makes war impossible, but look at this case. There was trade and then there was war. That's a misunderstanding of uh, the principle of inference in political science. It doesn't make it impossible. It makes it less likely. And that is a very good thing. And the empirical evidence, as well as the empirical theory, is now simply overwhelming. If you support peace, you must support freedom of trade. There really isn't any other alternative. The old saying, when goods cannot cross borders, armies will. And then, very importantly, just as the philosophy of liberty requires the presumption of liberty, it also requires a presumption against war. Uh, namely, if you are not for the war, you must be against it. Now, there are some other justifications we hear for war. Uh, it pays. It's very important because it will lead to economic stimulus, where we have to have war for oil and so on. And of course, we must readily recognize that war does support various special interests, uh, the contractors and others, of course. But does it pay for society as a whole? The answer is unequivocally no, it does not. The fact is, it bankrupts the society. And this was known by the classical liberals of old. Adam Smith put it very neatly. He pointed out that in the last two wars, speaking in his time, more than 200 millions have been spent. New debt of more than 170 millions has been contracted over and above all that expended for the same purpose in former wars. He pointed out that just the interest of that debt was greater not only than the whole profit gained by merchants involved in the trade of the the protected trade with the colonial uh, 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 markets, but it was greater than the value of all the trade aggregated. This was an absurd subsidy from the whole of the population to a small minority of the population. The free trade liberals were the only serious opposition to imperialism and militarism. John Bright, I have a long quotation there. He pointed out that the British Empire was uh, neither more nor less than a gigantic system of outdoor relief, old-fashioned language for welfare, for the aristocracy of Great Britain. That's been demonstrated through the economic statistics. A wonderful book by Lance Davis and Robert Huttenbeck, which is cited and referenced in Peace, Love, and Liberty, that pointed that the British as a whole certainly did not benefit economically from the empire. On the other hand, Individual investors did, but they did so at the expense of the general population. We sometimes hear it said today that we need war for oil. We have to be involved in the Middle East in order to guarantee our access to oil. Secretary of State James Baker made that argument in 1990 and uh, for the first uh, uh, Gulf War that we had to do this to secure the oil. This is rubbish. It is an economic uh, fallacy. First, even if you take the value of the oil and look at the worst case scenario of a cutoff of resources, the loss is much less than the total expenditure on military expenditures. So just from a green eye shade perspective, it's an idiotic, stupid argument. They assume as if the war making power is costless. But as William Niskanen, the former chairman of the K21, so the late William Niskanen, in his debate with former CIA Director James Woolsey, which you can find online, online, it's well worth watching, said oil is not worth the war. We have a world market for oil. And he points out, even if you set aside the other moral imperatives against war, and just look at the dollars and cents, if that's all you cared about, it's a bad deal. There is no economic justification whatsoever for going to war. Again, even setting aside the uh, other moral costs, the destruction of life involved. So we don't need, and people do not benefit from wars for national glory or wars for national prestige. 
We don't need wars to turn us into real men. We don't need wars for energy or even wars to end all wars. We do need, and the vast majority of people do benefit from peace, from freedom of trade, from limited government, from the freedom to challenge government policy, and from liberty generally. That is what people need, not war and war interventionism. Now, our cause and our arguments can win. Some people might think, wow, well, oh, you just can't fight against war machines. That's not true. They have changed the word already. Pinker makes a very strong case in his book that the advance of classical liberalism led to a general diminution in the human experience of violence, and that we may be living in the most peaceable era in our species' existence. There is more work to be done, but when you look back over the past, a great deal has been done. Let's look at the percentage of territorial wars that resulted in the redistribution of territory. Dramatic decline, although there's a tiny, tiny uptick uh, just in the last year here. You can see with uh, uh, Crimea. But in general, uh, that's an aberration. Wars that, for conquest of territory have gone down. The probability of military disputes between pairs of democracies and other pairs of countries also declining substantially over the last 70 years or thereabouts. If we look at where wars and violent conflicts tend to take place, unsurprisingly, you find them in areas of low income. These are the areas where trade has not yet penetrated. And it's very important that those parts of the world, when they become more open to trade, will also tend to realize the other benefits of trade, which is peace. International trade relative to GDP has increased quite dramatically. This makes it much more costly for nations to go to war and even for the elites of those countries who bear this a huge sacrifice and forever diminishing benefits. It's been understood for a very long time that voluntary trade creates civilization. Very important po uh, poem, The Odyssey by Homer, puts this quite neatly. In the story of Odysseus uh, being shipwrecked on the island of the Cyclops, the story is told that the Cyclops is quite uh, aggressive, if you will, and catches Odysseus's men and tears them apart and eats them. Not very hospitable. Odysseus asks, he says, what is my guest gift? As it was traditional in Greek society that guests, that people wash up on your island, you should uh, feed and clothe them so they can go on their way. And the Cyclops says, I will eat you last of all, which is not a very attractive gift. Homer then asks, what is it that makes a cyclops a savage? And the answer is quite interesting. For the cyclops have no ships with crimson prows, no shipwrights there to build them good strong craft that could sail them out to foreign ports of call, as most men risk the seas to trade with other men. The cyclops is a savage because he doesn't trade lives in the ideal world of the anti-globalization movement. All production and consumption is local. But because of that, he's a savage. So fundamentally, to conclude, war is a choice. And it's not one in which you can be neutral. If you're not for the war, you have to be against it. There is a very substantial presumption against war going to war, always and everywhere. Now, there may be reasons for waging war, but those are limited entirely to defensive action, not going and getting access to cheaper resources or national glory or being the indispensable nation or any of the other arguments advanced in favor of it. So to be against aggression, invasion, and violence, against war, that is what we are required to do. We have to stand against these kinds of aggressive actions. Now. Here's a list of some of the authors. It includes poetry, Wilfred Owen and Mark Twain. These are obviously reprinted. Uh, the other essays are originally commissioned uh, for this volume, with one exception, Stephen Pinker's. Uh, we uh, condensed from a longer essay he had elsewhere, but all of the others are original to this volume. So let me conclude with something that Frederick Bastiat said when he was challenged, as he had been very critical in the parliament against the national budget and money for expenditure. And he put it very neatly, liberty within, peace without, this is the entire plan. That, I believe, is the libertarian approach.
thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to a discussion. Over to you, Matt. All right, I see some questions are being set up. Can you hear me? All right. Okay, if you'd like to ask questions, you can ask them in text in the questions tab on the right, or you can click video chatting up into the right of where you see me, and then click start your webcam, and that'll allow me to bring you on screen. All right, I guess I will uh, get us started with the questions. Um, let's see, you, you referred to uh, the, the empirical evidence for uh, supporting the, the quote, when goods cannot cross borders, armies will. Uh, what does uh, some of that evidence look like? Do, do we see uh, significant uh, decreases uh, in if, if we're uh, measuring uh, freedom of trade, such as how the Heritage Foundation does it, or the Fraser Institute with their uh, their index of economic freedom. Uh, yes, actually. It, so it, is is that the the metric we use? Well, what you can look at is militarized interstate disputes, and you find a robust negative correlation between. Uh, militarized disputes between states and the volume of trade between them and the degree of trade freedom. So if you take, for instance, the Economic Freedom of the World Report and look at the Trade Freedom Index, and then controlling for other variables such as uh, uh, geographical proximity, a war between Finland and Korea is a bit unlikely since they don't share a common border. But taking all of those features uh, into account, that two things. One is the degree of their of economic freedom to trade across borders is negatively correlated robustly with the likelihood of interstate uh, military conflict. And second, even the volume of trade between the two potential combatants is negatively correlated. That there is a diminution of trade for every additional increment in the value of the trade that grows across those two borders. The third ingredient that's really quite interesting is the degree of cross-border investment. So not merely trade of goods across borders, uh, um, shipping automobiles one way and uh, uh, watches the other way, or whatever it might happen to be, but the degree to which the owners are in one country and the assets are in the, the other country. The reason for that is when you own something in another country with which your government may go to war, you have an additional reason to oppose going to war. They're going to blow up your stuff. Valuable trading relationships that you have and just the value of your assets will be wiped out. Now, some people have said, oh my gosh, how could you possibly think that that's a reason against war? Well, the fact of the matter is, if going to war, everyone recognizes some people support war because they make money from it some defense contractors, for example. Well, people also oppose war if they lose money from it. Duh, it seems fairly obvious and clear. But the left is very hesitant to embrace this sort of understand this sort of reasoning. But the evidence is clear, and on a common sense basis, we can see why, when you have trade across borders, you now have two more voices, at least, one on each side of the border, who have an interest in the maintenance of peace. And that's a very, very good thing. Yeah, it's a, a simple supply and demand problem. If you increase the costs of going to war, then theoretically uh, you'll, you'll have uh, less demand for war. Now we've got a question from Tiffany Madison. Uh, what do you think will ever bring about the decline in influence or power of the American military industrial complex? Well, I think that's a very interesting question because it's certainly uh, quite significant, but I think it's sometimes more subtle than many people think. 
uh, it permeates university life, intellectual life. It's not just the case you have tank manufacturers lobbying for war. What they lobby for is more tank manufacturing if it's going to bring business into their uh, um, district and into their firm. This has been something that's been known in Washington for years, that the military will specifically request the cancellation of weapons programs that they say are not necessary. But they continue. Why? Because those uh, units are built in the districts of powerful members of Congress. Unsurprisingly, if you look at major uh, hardware manufacturing, what you will find is systematically some major component of every tank or uh, jet is built in the districts of all the members of the Armed Services Committees of the House and the Senate. This is not an accident. Uh, this is the way that the political system works. So you end up with over-expenditure on a wide variety of military hardware. We have another element of this that is somewhat more recent and has grown, and that is the use of contractors that uh, contract with the US military to provide services abroad. And they have a strong interest also in this. I think that the best way to curb their power is to have a stronger presumption against going to war and to also have a public and a political system that scrutinizes military budgets and asks the following question. Is this, in fact, truly necessary for the defense of the United States of America? That's number one question. If it's necessary, then you have an argument for it. If it's not necessary, you shouldn't be buying it for the actual defense of the United States of America. A great deal of the force projection uh, involved is, has nothing to do with the defending the United States. It's about defending other countries or holding up the flag or uh, fulfilling other purposes that, quite frankly, are not even authorized in the Constitution of the United States. That's the fundamental question. People should be highly skeptical. And we should also encourage our conservative friends, who are often skeptical of various kinds of government spending, to have the same kind of skepticism uh, towards military expenditures that they have uh, towards others. But those are also subject to rent-seeking, lobbying, and other activities that are not productive of the public interest. All right, we've got a question from Travis McCurry. He'd like to come on air to ask it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> can y'all hear me? Yes, I can. and you're not great. Yes, actually, my fiance Tiffany got me a new webcam, so thanks to her. Uh, my question for you is this: uh, Right now, we are have 270 plus bases all over the world right now, and we need to bring them home. Uh, if you were able, or the person in charge. How would you go about doing it? Like, how would it be done? It, it, I mean, this is kind of a little bit different of a question, so I do apologize. But, you know, you know, how do, how do how do you transition from this kind of society where we are so involved, and so heavily invested in empire building, to going back to where we just have our troops here at home, just have what we have here in the states? That's a great question. It, there's nothing odd or strange about that question at all. It's exactly the question I wish would be asked more often uh, on the floor of the United States Congress. Uh, the first thing is it's not that difficult. The United States has military bases all around the world where we don't need them. In fact, we have military bases inside the United States where we don't need them. It's interesting that there are U.S. military bases up along the Canadian border. Uh, naturally, we have to guard against the, the incursion of uh, dangerous Canadians across our borders. Uh, it's very difficult uh, for the U.S. Congress to close bases even in the U.S. because every base means that there are various economic enterprises that service that base and the consequence, of course, they talk to their congressmen to oppose base closings. So that's a political problem in the U.S. Fortunately, abroad, you don't have that problem because local uh, contractors and restaurateurs and others in other countries, whether they're Korea or Japan or, or Germany or Italy or wherever, uh, fortunately don't lobby American members of Congress very effectively. So there's very little excuse on a, even just a, a partisan political basis for not closing these bases. I think that what's needed is a systematic look at uh, U.S. military commitments, 
driven by this question, is it constitutionally authorized as necessary for the defense of the United States of America? If not, close it down. That includes well, our the... bases in Europe. We have been subsidizing the European nation's defense structure for decades, and certainly the case is stronger with the end of the Soviet Union uh, that they should have been closed years ago, and Europeans should have been looking to their own resources for their own defense, not the American taxpayer. Well, I don't the, think con the, concern, thing to do. the concern I brought up about this is just to give you a little bit of background. Uh, I am a soldier. Um, I am a National Guard soldier, and I deal with these types of industries a lot. I deal with people who uh, benefit these type of industries a lot. And while I am a libertarian, I think a lot of these should be closed. Uh, the, my, my question to you is, when you go to these people who work on these bases, and even if they're completely civilians who just benefit from these type of, um, these type of military complexes, how do you convince them to say, you know, this base needs to be closed, we're basically doing away with your job? How do you, how do you go out convincing them well, fortunately, they're not the only people that you need to convince. We also need to convince all the people who are paying the bills, which is the vast majority of the population. And I don't think that's hard to convince them. Now, from the perspective of the military, just between you and me and everyone else who's listening, uh, most soldiers are not gung-ho militarists, right? Agreed. You understand that. The image that was portrayed of soldiers by, let's say, some anti-war uh, protesters during the Vietnam War era was very unfortunate. They accused them of being baby killers and monsters, and of course there were some among them. A majority of them were conscripts. They did not want to be there. Uh, and even among professional soldiers, they do not see their job in life as massacring innocent people. They no, the majority of soldiers see them as more of a, as a hero role. I guess you could say well, as a, I don't know about as a duty or hero role. It's a duty. But, but the point of the, of the matter is that if you said um, the defense of the United States does not require you to be stationed in Africa, we have a substantial military presence now in Africa with AFRICOM. This is not necessary for the defense of the United States of America, and you will be withdrawn to American bases. Frankly, I don't think you're going to get a whole lot of pushback from that. So that's, no. that group is not going to fight on that issue. And the vast majority of the American people have to have it explained to them that it is not necessary for the United States government to extend its military power all across the planet to protect them. In fact, it puts them at greater risk because it puts them at risk of being involved in many, many conflicts that otherwise would have been resolved locally, sometimes without resort to force and without bringing in the American people. So in effect, we're being held hostage the foreign policy agendas of many other governments around the world. When it's explained in that way, I think most Americans understand this is a bad deal for them. Roger. Thank you. All right. Thank Thanks, Travis. We've got another question uh, from Matthias von Gutenberg, who would like to come on air. All right. Hello. Hey, Tom. Hello, can you hear Matthias. Me? I can. Hey, great. Great. Thank you so much for this great talk. I always enjoy listening to. Uh, you speak about the dynamics of war and society and so forth. Uh, I just have a question for you. How do you think the ability for states to go to war uh, changes with regards to the kind of wealth of the society they're trying to convince? Do you think like the propaganda is different? Do you think that they have to resort to different tools to convince a wealthy society to go to war versus a, a poor society? Or, or is it all kind of the same strategy no matter where you are? Well, I think there are all kinds of dynamics. Oh, you might want to turn down your sound there. Uh, all kinds of dynamics at work there. One of the key things is having a, an authentically free and open media. And this is now easier in countries that have access to Internet because there's been a fragmentation of media. When the United States had only three television networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS, they pretty much all sang the same tune. Uh, and indeed, if you were critical at that time, you could lose your broadcasting license. And there were people who were thrown off the air because their broadcasting was believed to be not in the public interest. Fortunately, that would be much more difficult to do in a freer, open societies like the United States, where I think there's a more healthy skepticism. And after the catastrophe of the Iraq War and the admitted failure and the buyer's remorse 
on the part of those people who were so enthusiastic about it. It didn't really turn out like they expected. I think that the American people are um, uh, much more skeptical of those claims. Now, if you go to societies, however, that have uh, state control of the media, I'm going to think about Russia in this context, uh, aggressive behavior on the part of the Russian state is turning out to be extremely popular. And the primary reason is the Russian state controls 99.999 something percent of the media. All broadcast media, all radio and all television are under the control of the Kremlin, with the exception of Echo Moscovy, a very tiny um, radio station in Moscow. They control most of the print media. And there is the internet, where a lot of opposition to uh, war has been expressed. But even there, they have now passed a law to license websites in Russia. So we can expect sometime next year, it is likely that all dissenting websites will be taken down and blocked uh, in Russia as they are in Iran. It's much more difficult under those circumstances when you don't have free expression. And our friends, the Students for Liberty members in Russia who have been arrested, were arrested simply for standing in public with a piece of paper that said love. And that got them arrested and spent the night in prison and then fined for an unauthorized public manifestation. It is much more difficult and, frankly, personally more risky in those societies to oppose uh, war than it is in the United States. In the U.S., it's not that hard. And I think that we need to be very active at being extremely critical, subjecting claims of our politicians to scrutiny, uh, and when appropriate, laughing at them and mocking them for the absurd uh -huh. claims that they make. Yeah, mocking them. So as kind of a follow-up, do you think then that the openness and the expansion of the internet and the ability to allow people to kind of bypass these great firewalls, China or Russia as it may be, I think opening up the internet is going to uh, open up the ability to resist war much more effectively? I think so. And look at what Mr. So Snowden accomplished by releasing mm. uh, enormous information about illegal, uh, constitutionally prohibited spying on the American people uh, through the NSA. Uh, that would not have happened through the official media, or even media that were liable to being censored or shut down uh, by the state. Right. So even a free media like CNN or at Fox or NMS, NBC or whatever, they still fear the possibility that there are choke points that could be closed off, and, go, and the FBI and others come to them and say, look, 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 don't do this. And Gr Glenn right. Greenwald, God bless him, uh, revealed this information and did so, I should say, also in a very thoughtful and responsible way, um, looking at them to see if there was anything that endangered innocence uh, and not releasing that, but in fact releasing information about illegal behavior. So I'm very grateful for that. Unfortunately, in some countries, the trend has been uh, to make the Internet more difficult. Iran uh, is an example. Uh, Russia, I think, is trending in that direction. The Internet has been fairly free, but they're experimenting with shutting it down regionally. This is a, a trial run or something worse. And then China with the Great Firewall. It right. is not 100% effective. Information still gets out. But they are still able to keep that information away from at least 90% of the population. So it circulates among people who are likely to be disaffected already, the smaller percentage of intellectually aware people. So I think Internet freedom is very, very important. And that's one reason why it's important to resist imposition of state media, to resist censorship, and to insist on keeping the internet free so that states cannot exert a chokehold on it. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you answering my questions, and I appreciate you giving a great talk as well. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, we've got a question from Lincoln Gardner. What about religious justification for war? Isn't the Bahavik Bhagavad Gita, an example, uh, how much weight would you give to religious justification? Oh, that's a very interesting question. And in the Bhagavad Gita, it's not exactly a justification for war as such. Uh, that's the case in which uh, Krishna makes the argument that um, the great hero should go to war. He gives a very beautiful speech against war because he says, on the other side, I see brothers... I see uncles and fathers and sons and cousins 
I don't see just the enemy or warriors. And he says, I, I can't uh, go to war. And Krishna uh, encourages him, gives quite an argument. It's well worth reading. But it's an argument in this case, uh, not about war per se, but about why it's important to uh, fight in this particular war. So it's not a generic argument for war. And the question of religion, this is largely a question of interpretation. So one might interpret the Bhagavad Gita as a defensive war as such. I just gave an interpretation that it wasn't. It was a defense of the use of violence in a particular case to achieve justice, but not a defensive war per se. So interpretation is needed. And that interpretation has been applied in many great religious traditions in an increasingly pacific uh, or anti-war way. So let's look at the uh, Old Testament, as the Christians call it, the collection of books, uh, many of which contain pretty horrifying statements of what you should do against the other people in other cities and towns. Uh, quite gruesome, quite explicit. And over time, those were interpreted as being time and place specific, not general admonitions to engage in massacre and slaughter. So Jews today and Christians in general in the bulk have had a pacific pro-peace position. There's an ongoing discussion within Islam about this question as well. What is the nature of jihad? What is, what is one called upon as a Muslim to do? Those who interpret Islam as inherently violent are actively embracing the interpretation of Osama bin Laden. But the majority of Muslims, the majority of Muslim theologians, do not in, embrace that interpretation. There's a great internal debate and struggle and even civil war going on uh, within Islam worldwide between those who uh, view the religion as calling them to war against non-believers and those who interpret instead other passages of the Quran and the Hadith to call them to peace. And as I say, that there's no compulsion in matters of religion. These are battles of rival interpretations. And there are pro-peace interpretations and pro-war interpretations in great religious traditions. Uh, I work closely with those who advocate peace regardless of their religion, and I embrace them uh, as friends in the struggle for peace, whether they are Christian or Muslim or Jewish or Hindu or anything else. All right, we've got uh, one more question. Uh, it's from Tiffany Madison. Do you think that, oh, what do you think the AFRICOM ramp up is all about? Competing with the Chinese over resources or something else? That's a very good question, and I don't think it's obvious what the answer is at the moment. But I don't think the competition for resources is the primary feature. I think this is a case of a mission um, outstripping itself, if you will. The argument is that we have to defeat Al-Qaeda. And consequently, any group out there that we could argue, or someone could argue is Al-Qaeda affiliated, has to be an enemy of the United States. And therefore, if it's an enemy of the United States, the logic says that it requires the application of military force and assets. I think that's essentially what is driving AFRICOM. The issue of whether there is a mercantilistic struggle between China and the United States or European Union over uh, assets, uh, raw materials in Africa, I think is uh, very implausible. It's worth thinking about and considering. But the Chinese government has been spending a staggering amount of money for uh, access to raw materials. They are paying a very substantial premium, much more than the commodity price of those resources. Uh, they pay it in the form of corruption, suitcases of cash given to African political leaders, and uh, subsidized uh, highway construction deals that, in fact, are then built by Chinese companies. It really is just a form of cronyism, subsidizing Chinese firms at the expense of the Chinese state. It uh, has very little to do with Africa per se. It's just cronyism. Given that, uh, the Chinese government is doing something foolish and stupid. I had a meeting with uh, the equivalent of the Council of Economic Advisors in China about this question and sat down and said, look, you pay more than the world price for oil, to take an example. This is not smart. Why do you, don't you just pay the world price? You pay, for instance, for uh, exclusive contracts with, com with countries, and that exclusivity generates a premium. Oil is a commodity. 
is the reason why Venez the Venezuelan government sells their oil to the United States, despite the official enmity of the Maduro and previously Chavez governments to, to the United States. It's a commodity. They just sell it for the best price they can get. You're paying more than you should be paying, and then you bring it back to China, and then you subsidize its use by favored state industries, giving them a big uh, subsidy. This is doubly stupid. This is a good way to bankrupt yourself. It is not the road to prosperity. So uh, I don't really see this as somehow the United States needs access to uh, uh, African uh, raw materials. Very little is imported from Africa in any case. It's a very insignificant part of trade with the United States or, the, or even the European Union. I think in, instead it's a case of mission creep. It was declared our enemy is Al-Qaeda. Therefore, anyone we can tag or who even tags themselves as Al-Qaeda affiliated is an enemy. And next premise, if it's an enemy, it merits uh, U.S. military attacks. I think that's really what's driving it more than anything else, rather than a nefarious uh, economic interest. But again, this is an issue that deserves more study and thought. All right, I think that does it for the questions. Uh, thanks everyone for coming and thank you, Dr. Palmer, for this wonderful presentation. And thank our you. next session is an author's Absolutely. Our next session is an author's forum tomorrow with Dr. Peter Leeson on his book Anarchy Unbound at 3 p.m. Eastern. Hope to see you there. And make sure to check out uh, Peace, Love, and Liberty. And especially if you're involved with any student groups make sure to go to SFL's website and order free books for your student group. Thanks everyone and have a great night.